Let's be to you in peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I apologize for my voice. This happens sometimes in the spring. But on Easter. <coughs> The text that I've chosen for this Easter morning is the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 11 and following. Mary, Mary Magdalene, stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. This is the text. <coughs> Your Christian friends, 800 years ago, Richard, the bishop of the English town of Chichester, wrote a simple prayer that said, Thanks be to thee, O Lord Jesus Christ, for all the benefits thou hast given me, for all the pains and insults thou hast borne for me. O most merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, may I know thee more clearly, may I love thee more dearly, may I follow thee more nearly, day by day. His prayers some of you maybe have picked up on, was adapted for use in one of the better-known songs from the 70s uh, musical, Godspell. In the musical, Mary Magdalene sings these words, day by day, day by day, O oh, dear Lord, three things I pray, to see thee more clearly, note the word change, to see thee more clearly, love thee more dearly, follow thee more nearly, day by day. Those words placed on the lips of Mary Magdalene fit in very well with the event that our text, our text describes and gives us a goal for our Easter celebration. From the resurrection account in John's Gospel, we learn that Mary Magdalene had returned to the tomb after reporting to Peter and John that the tomb was empty, Jesus' body gone. Peter and John had already come and gone by the time that Mary returned to the grave site. There she stood, outside the tomb, alone and weeping. This Mary probably was a resident of the sea to of the seacoast town of Magdala, located a few miles south of Capernaum, the city where Jesus spent much of his ministry. <coughs> the Gospel of Luke tells us that Jesus had healed her from demon possession rescuing her from seven demons which had made her a prisoner in her own body. No doubt it was in order to show her gratitude for this great deliverance that Mary had become one of the faithful followers of Jesus. She, along with several other women, traveled with Jesus and provided for the daily support of Jesus and his disciples out of their own means. No less than the twelve disciples, Mary had forsaken all to follow Jesus. Mary and the other women had stood at a distance to witness Jesus' crucifixion, again demonstrating their loyalty and devotion to Jesus. They watched as Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and observed the place where Jesus was buried. Let's give these women credit where credit is due. They were the last at the cross and the first at the tomb. As they had served their Lord in life, so they came on Easter morning to serve him in death by completing the preparation of his body for proper burial. It was a beautiful act of love that the women wanted to perform on the dead body of Jesus. But how wrong they were because they didn't believe the word of Jesus, that he would rise again on the third day. They had either missed or dismissed his repeated predictions of his rising. And so we find Mary outside the tomb of Jesus, tears flowing in abundance. 
as we, see, as we hear the story told, we feel like jumping back into time and breaking the news of her that would transform her grief into joy. We'd like to break into this scene and announce to Mary that her tears are being wasted. But we can't go back in time, so we'll just have to let the events take care of themselves. Woman, why are you weeping? That was the question put to her by two angels in white sitting in the spa where Jesus' body had once lain. And hardly had she given them a response about someone taking away the body of her Lord when she turns and sees Jesus. That is, see, she's a, she sees a man standing next to her, but she doesn't at first recognize him. The man whom she assumes to be the gardener asks her the same question. Woman, why are you weeping? And then adds... Whom are you seeking? We breathe a sigh of relief and think to ourselves, surely now she's going to see the light. But Mary still fails to recognize Jesus. The truth of the resurrection is still just beyond her grasp. Perhaps she fails to see Jesus clearly because the, the tears in her eyes are blurring her vision. Or maybe her experience was similar to that of those two forlorn disciples on the road to Emmaus, whose eyes, Luke tells us, were kept from recognizing Jesus. This, you recall, was by God's doing to prepare them for the lesson which Jesus was soon to teach them from the Old Testament scriptures as they walked along together. Whatever the case, and I prefer the latter, it was Jesus who had to create the seeing that led to believing. And he does it with a single word, Mary. When the good shepherd calls his sheep, they know his voice. It was a voice she had never expected to hear again. Suddenly it was Easter. And the tears of grief became tears of joy. Now she saw Jesus clearly. The veil in front of her eyes was lifted. The cloud of doubt and sorrow was dispelled. And now we're here this morning, standing as it were outside the empty tomb of Jesus. But what do we make of it? Is there anything that blurs our vision and keeps us from believing the glorious message of the resurrection. Sometimes Christians allow their personal grief and sorrow to blind their eyes to the real message of Christ's resurrection. Like Mary at the beginning, they never get beyond the point of weeping at the graveside of a loved one. The death which we see is more real to us than the resurrection and reunion which we cannot see which is still only a promise. But just as we look confidently beyond the cross to Christ's empty tomb, from Good Friday to Easter, we, which signals his victory over death, so we also must look beyond the grave, our own or that of a loved one, to see that one day we, with all those who have died in Christ, we will share in that victory over death. Because of Easter, we can confess in the words of the Nicene Creed as we did just earlier. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. For Christians, death doesn't lead to death, to eternal separation from God. It leads to life. This is the promise that Jesus made to Martha shortly before he raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. You know these words. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Those words are no less true today, confirmed to be true by Jesus' resurrection. Jesus kept the promise that he made in regard to his own resurrection 
and he will just as surely keep the promise which he makes regarding our resurrection. He is the first fruits, as Paul calls him in 1 Corinthians 15, just a little past our epistle reading. That means that we who belong to him will surely follow. There are times as well that we fail to see the resurrected Christ clearly because we fail to trust his word and take hold of his promises. Promises meant for us. That's precisely what the disciples of Jesus were guilty of. Jesus had told them again and again that he must die, but that he would then be raised on the third day. For the disciples, those words of Jesus merely traveled in one ear and, and out the other. They heard, but they didn't believe. Is it possible that we have heard our Lord's promise to forgive us and assume that he is talking about someone else? We hear the pastor speak the absolution in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ only to doubt that those words could apply to us. We are too sinful, we think. Or we've sinned too much, too often, to believe that God could forgive us for Jesus' sake. No, the Lord means what he says. He keeps his promise and is always faithful to his word. To make the point even stronger and personal, he gives us his body to eat and his blood to drink. With his word of assurance, this is my body for you. This is my blood for you. It's a form of, a form of hebris on our part to think that we, our sins, are too great for the power and greatness of Christ's forgiving love. What's more, we don't see Jesus clearly when we limit him as Lord of our lives to a token hour or so a week or even a segment of our lives that we call our religion. When we squeeze him into a schedule that puts everything else, family, work, recreation, ahead of him. Easter means that the risen Christ wants to be Lord of all of our life as he is Lord of all the universe. There's no part of our lives, whether job, or family, or friendships, or talents and abilities, nothing over which Jesus' lordship doesn't extend. He is there to direct, control, to empower all our living and doing. What aspect of ourselves have we placed outside God's control? Our temper? Our tongue, our money, our time. We need to join the psalmist and say, Create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit, an Easter spirit, within me. It's clear from the New Testament that the resurrection of Jesus was the decisive turning point that opened the eyes of the disciples to see God's purpose and plan for the world and for themselves. The resurrection made everything that Jesus had preached and taught suddenly come into focus and fall into place. It was the key that interpreted the meaning of Jesus' life and his death, confirming that he was and is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and establishing his death as the full payment for all sins accepted now by the Father. It was the event that transformed this makeshift band of fishermen, tax collectors, and other miscellaneous sorts into bold witnesses who would soon turn the world upside down. That included the Apostle Paul, who was turned from persecutor of the Church of God to proclaimer of the gospel. The message of the resurrection can also have the same transforming power on our lives. The resurrection of Jesus means not only that there is a resurrection for us on the last day, 
and eternal life for us in the new heaven and new earth. It means that the resurrection life can begin already now, today. It begins for you and me the moment that the Holy Spirit moves our hearts to repent of our sins and believe in Christ as Lord and Savior. Through the gospel, the Spirit enables us to see Jesus with the eyes of faith and trust in Him for forgiveness and salvation. It is the Easter message that gives us new direction and meaning for it, <coughs> that assures us that God can make good on all His promises to us, even as He has made good on His promise to rise after three days. It is Christ's resurrection that makes us see Christ more clearly for who he is and what he did. The Lord of life himself who offers us that life now and forever through him. And as we see him more clearly, we are also moved to love him more dearly with greater commitment and sacrifice. Thee will I love my strength, my tower, sings the Easter Christian. Thee will I love my hope, my joy. Thee will I love with all my power, with order time shall ne'er destroy. Sings and lives. And as we see more clearly, we also follow more nearly. We follow our Lord, making His will our will in ever-increasing measure. There's a hymn for that too. Let us ever walk with Jesus, follow His example pure. Faithful Lord, with me abide, I shall follow where you guide. As Easter Christians, we have new purposes for which to live, to serve Him and do His will, to serve Him by serving one another in love, and to work for the advancement of His kingdom, spreading the gospel into all the world. And we do all this with our ultimate destiny in view, knowing that heaven will be our home, where we shall one day be with our Lord and participate in His glory. May our eyes be opened as were the eyes of Mary Magdalene to see Jesus clearly as the risen Lord and may we share in his resurrection power, power which enables us to love him more dearly, follow him more dearly, day by day. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed.